Hello, good afternoon. America's space bird Columbia, reluctant for more than a month now to leave the nest a second time, is poised at last for another try. Eight days ago, it came within 31 seconds of liftoff. Today, there was another two and a half hours delay. They say now she'll go in just under 15 minutes' time, at 3 o'clock our time. But I should imagine you'll believe it when you see it. But when it does happen, you'll be watching history in the making. Never before has a spaceship flown a second mission, the first step towards space travel becoming routine. Watching this second test flight with us, the experienced eye of astronaut Dick Gordon, veteran of two missions, Gemini 11, in which he walked in space, and Apollo 12, the second moon landing, in which his job was to pilot the command module, which circled the moon while Pete Conrad and Al Bean went down to the surface. Dick, do you expect Columbia to go today? Peter, I sure do. It looks like they've already had their problem. It should go. They're in the final verification before they pick up the count at nine minutes, which should be very shortly. Dick, thank you. Well, our man at Cape Canaveral is John Suchet. What do the prospects look like, John, from where you're standing? Good morning, Peter, from the Cape. And good news right away. It's a gloriously warm and sunny Florida day. A little bit of cloud, but nothing like the overcast skies of a week ago. Uh, as long as it flies, you'll get a much better view of the launch today than you would have done a week ago. A little bit of wind, uh, which is not a problem for the launch. What worries them is that if they have to abort soon after the launch, they'll have to bring the shuttle back to the airstrip here. And in that case, wind could be a, pro uh, um, a problem. But at the moment, it's all clear for a launch. It was a hectic night here last night. Uh, yesterday, one of the shuttle's instruments, which glories in the name of multiplexer, demultiplexer, failed. Its backup failed too, so they stripped one out of Columbia's sister ship, Challenger, and flew it from the west coast right across the country to here. It was installed overnight, it works, and it's beginning to look as if Richard Truly will celebrate his 44th birthday with a trip into space, but nobody here is guaranteeing it. Back to you. Well, you heard John Suchet there mention that problem that was rectified overnight. We can now see the new part being uh, arriving at the Cape and being loaded into Columbia. There we are. Dick, what are they bringing? What is it? Well, you heard uh, John say it was a multiplexer, demultiplexer. Nothing more than a black avionics box that they have to use to uh, signal conditioning for instrument displays, computer talkbacks, and the like. It's essential for flight. It couldn't have gone without it? No, it wouldn't have gone without it. And if it had gone without it last time, would it have had to abort? When we're in flight, we can do a lot of things that uh, we can work around some of these kinds of problems. There is another box just like the one they put in that would uh, take in its place. Now, you heard John Suchet mention it was Dick Truly's 44th birthday. So it's a, it's a pre-launch breakfast with a difference this morning at the Cape. Normally they get up, they're woken early, they have their steak and eggs, and then it's off for suiting up and then to the launch pad. But this is what happened this morning at Cape Canaveral. There's uh, Dick Truly on the left there, next to Joe Engel, his, uh, his partner in today's flight, and the colleagues there at the astronaut HQ giving them a good send. Have you known a scene like that before, Dick? I've never been to a birthday party before launch. And you can see the cake. I think that's the cake there. It's a yeah. chocolate-looking construction in the shape, roughly, of a space <laughs> shuttle. And I don't think too, too much of its aerodynamics. Now, we can uh, remind Dick of something in his past, briefly, and tell you a bit more about him. He has the distinction of being uh, on board a blast-off from Cape Canaveral in 1969, which probably came nearer to having to abort just after liftoff than any other, because he was hit on board Apollo 12 by lightning 40 seconds after liftoff. Dick, this, this was it. It was kind of an interesting morning, uh, Peter, and the fact that there was a great deal of overcast, a lot of rain, the visibility was very poor. We really didn't think they were going to launch, but we were ready, and they did. Shortly after uh, we got airborne, 36 to 40 seconds, there was a big, loud roar at the yeah. Cape. Let's hear the sound. Just disappearing now. And then uh, Pete Conrad reported. Well, he reported that everything lit up like a Christmas tree when the electrical system went out. We really weren't quite sure what happened. Pete saw a blue flash, and we were quite sure then it was lightning. 
Now, we're coming up to the most critical part of the countdown, today's countdown, that is, the nine-minute mark at which the launch director must decide whether all his pre-launch checks allow him to go ahead. So, will it be nine minutes and holding, or nine minutes and counting? John Suchet is at the Cape, listening with us. Yes, Peter, we're approaching the end of the nine-minute hold. Uh, this is the hold in which the final checks are made, and at the end of it, if all is well, the go for launch is given. And after this hold, assuming that all is well, an automatic launching system begins. And, of course, it was at this stage last week that things started going badly wrong. So I'll let you hear now Space control, uh, Launch Control announce the end of the nine-minute hold. Well, we're still waiting for the end of that hold. It has not come. This is shuttle so launch control, T-minus nine minutes and holding. Launch director George Page asked for a slight delay in picking up the countdown at this point while he checks a couple of things which he heard during the countdown. He has just checked with the range safety officer to determine that a, uh, that a dropout of the main carrier uh, wave that is used by the range safety people uh, is not serious and that a backup carrier signal uh, is satisfactory. He is also checking on several other things and we will get back to you as soon as the determination has been made to pick up the countdown. This is shuttle launch control. Well, Peter, you heard that. Uh, there has been an extension of the hold um, indefinitely, but uh, we're told that the problem is not too serious, but for the moment there is an extension of the hold. Dick Gordon, how, how serious do you think that sounds? Peter, it sounds like we've been here before, but it sounds to me like it's nothing more than a communications problem. The range safety officer does have a backup system, but I'm sure George Page wants to make sure everything is in his favor before he commits to picking up at nine minutes. Who, who is this range safety officer? He's, just, he's the officer there that's watching the trajectory of the booster and the shuttle during its launch phase in case it deviates from project, predicted trajectories so they can alert the crew of a possibility of an abort situation occurring. He has a responsibility to make sure that that booster is clear of the beach. So there's no problem being picked up inside the orbiter? No, it's a communications problem in his own particular network. Nothing to do with the spacecraft. So at least that sounds okay. Well, I'm hopeful that we'll pick that up pretty quick. Well, let's move on now. Let's, let's, let's just talk about what's different for a moment about this second test flight while we've got a few moments in hand. It's longer for a start, 83 orbits instead of 36. The, uh, the first flight in April was, was 36. It's orbiting lower because it's slightly heavier, and it's heavier because of a number of experiments that are being carried. It's got its first payload, scientific payload, on board. Perhaps the most dramatic piece of new equipment being carried by Columbia is $100 million worth of bionic arms. And here it is. And in fact, Bionic is quite an apt description of this 50-foot cherry picker. It has a rotating shoulder socket, an elbow that moves in only one direction, and a wrist that has two joints and moves both ways. It was built as Canada's contribution to the shuttle technology. Now, that, its main task will be to lift satellites from the payload bay and position them in space and to retrieve satellites in need of repair. Its camera could also inspect the shuttle itself for damage to the tiles of the heat shield, as happened on that first test flight. Dick Truly, you can see him there, practicing, is the crewman assigned to working it. Some 13 hours will be spent putting it through its paces, which is impossible, you'll appreciate, on Earth, because its delicate mechanism is designed to operate in zero gravity. It weighs less than a 1,000 pounds, but its makers say in space it can pick up objects that weigh 65 times that. I'd have thought that in space, this cherry picker, Dick, could pick up anything if, if uh, nothing has any weight. Well, Peter, it probably could if it were mechanized to do so, but remember that uh, Newton's laws still have an effect, and there's a momentum problem. You have to start it moving, and once it's moving, you also have to stop it. So it has to have some structural rigidity and does have limitations. Is it a hazard to the crew? It's a possibility that it could be a hazard. I wouldn't like to think that it was, but it does have to be stowed before re-entry. Now, they have prepared for an EVA in case... EVA? Extravehicular activity. Walking to go around. outside and 
look at it and possibly get it back in. If that fails, they can jettison this arm so the cargo bays can close. Of course, it would be a very serious matter if, if it jammed the doors in some way. It certainly would. Those doors have to be closed for re-entry. Although the Canadians, I shouldn't imagine, would be all that pleased if they just kicked it adrift and it became another piece of space junk. Well, they wouldn't like to see that, but they would have to build another one for us. Right, well, now we're going to get an update on that hold. It's nine minutes and holding rather than nine minutes and counting at the Cape. We've got a small delay, but not inside the vehicle itself. Let's, let's go over to John Suchet at the Kennedy Space Center. Well, we're told that there are one or two little snags here, um, none of them serious, but the launch director, George Page, um, has spoken direct to the crew, and he said this to them, we're going to give you a good one. In other words, they're not going to let anything stand in the way of a perfect launch, uh, and they would rather hold it up a few minutes than have anything go wrong. So at the moment, one or two little problems causing a small delay, but again, not expected to, to cause much of a delay. John Suchet at Cape Canaveral. John, thank you. Let's now carry on with the theme of what's new about uh, this second test flight. I mentioned earlier it was taking a palette of scientific experiments. The man to tell us about that is ITN's space and science consultant, Dr. Gary Hunt. Gary, what are they up to? Well, we have seven experiments on the mission, five of which are actually on the spacecraft itself. And they're really a chance to start looking at the surface of the Earth and indeed the oceans for the first time from the shuttle orbit. I think we've got some pictures of the sort of thing they so might So we try to simulate the sort of things that can be done using existing so satellite uh, observations. And in fact, when we use Landsat as an example, we can see the rocks and rock structures to scales of just a few tens of metres. And this is an opportunity to look at different types of rock types. So we're looking at the resources that the Earth actually has. There is a second instrument, in fact, to look at the larger structures, the actual fragments of the rocks, and even look through the ocean, look at the ocean floor, which uh, again gives an idea of the, the importance of mineral structures that we can study. But also the ocean... Well, we seem to have... A... No, no, we, now we've got your picture OK, again. so was... now we're looking here at, at, at Landsat pictures of, in fact, of Devon, and you can see here the actual structures, and the false colouring bring out the different rock types that actually are present. So if we do this to the entire globe, we can use this as a means to classify the different uh, structures. Here we can see, using even higher resolution of 20 metres, the actual structures in the rocks and indeed the pipeline that goes out at the bottom of the ocean. So we're looking through the ocean here, and this is an opportunity then to study whole areas around. And these are looking at the uh, structures in the ocean itself for heat transport, again, relative to climate. So these major experiments are our first opportunity to try new experiments on Space Lab. There are two others looking at pollution of the atmosphere, and there are two more actually on the uh, area where the astronauts are themselves. They're taking photographs of lightning, and also they're studying... Uh, stop you, Barry. You have a nice ...that the clock will be picked up at one minute after 10 Eastern Standard Time this morning. We have just had a check of the various major managers for this morning's launch. Norm Carlson has conducted that uh, check, and all of the managers have said they are ready to pick up at the proper time. The launch director, George Page, has just asked Deke Slayton, the OFT launch manager, if he is go, and Deke Slayton has said he is go for launch. We're about two minutes away from picking up the countdown at the T-minus nine-minute point, which would result in a launch at 10.10 a.m. this morning. This is shuttle launch control. Well, Dick Gordon, that means that they that they hope to go now, but 10 minutes late. Peter, they'll start uh, a few minutes after the hour to start that nine-minute countdown when it goes on the automatic sequencer, and I still expect it to go. Now, this, this nine-minute period, why mm -hmm. nine minutes? It's where the automatic sequencer starts all of its functions to automatically check the booster, the spacecraft, and everything associated with launch and it takes that nine minute period right down to engine ignition. Now what we're going to, to do now, I think I've just got a moment actually to remind you of how the shuttle gets up and down and what uh, diff makes it different from other space vehicles. Now, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, Dick, but we've come a long way since people like you were, were put on the, in, a, in a tin can on top of a rocket and blasted up and nothing could be used again, and even the tin can when it came down was useless to anybody. We do bring some of it back this time, don't we? Yeah, we bring back, uh, we bring back the, the solid uh, fuel booster rockets here. These are reusable, these are the pack horses that, that get it into orbit. 
The rocket's own motors, which are on the bottom here, are fueled by... Uh, by this, uh, by fueling this huge tank here. That's the only throwaway part. That's the, that's, that's that's the external tank is scheduled to be jettisoned in the Indian Ocean. That's right. Yeah, and that, that's $6 million worth, but they throw it away. But anyway, the rest is reusable. That's what makes it totally different. And of course, the whole thing, when it's finished, its mission comes back on its wings. We go over to the All of the major managers have indicated they are ready to go. And we are at T minus nine minutes and counting. The launch sequence are now being controlled by the ground launch sequencer from now up to the T minus 31 second point when they'll switch to the onboard redundant set launch sequencer. The ground launch sequencer is part of the launch processing system and operates by relaying commands to the orbiter's onboard computers, which then reports back to the launch processing system that the commands have been executed. The primary job of the computers is to check that all of the launch commit criteria are being met, such as propellant loads, temperatures, pressures, and other measurements. The chase aircraft have been launched from Patrick Air Force Base to take part in the activities of this morning's launch. T-minus 8 minutes, 10 seconds, and counting. Dick, uh, Dick Gordon, a quick translation. They're going. They're going to count down, and they're going to get this thing off the ground this time, Peter. I knew when they had the problems last night that we could expect something good to happen. How far, given the enormous pressures from the administration on the cost of this thing, which is running so late, would it be a political decision to go today? No, I don't believe so. I don't think anybody would, would acquiesce to that kind of thing. This is, there's too much on the line for this thing to fly and fly properly and get all the tests objectives completed that this flight is intended to perform. What has held it up before, of course, is computers. Computers have spotted some last-minute defect. Do you think the computers are too sophisticated on this machine? No, they're not too sophisticated. We need them. But one problem with computers, Peter, is that they cannot make decisions. Uh, they can't make They judgments. can make no judgments. They make decisions yes or no. But they can't make judgment factors in between these two lines. That's correct. Do you think they may have to adjust uh, the, the software, as they call it, in, in some way to make sure that fewer flights are delayed? Uh, the more we learn, modifications could very likely be made. We can open up the limits, a lot of parameters, as we gain experience flying this thing more and more, so that some of these real tight limits now could be relaxed. Now, Joe Engel and Dick Trulli are sitting there on their backs, pointing at the sky, What's going through their minds? You've been through it twice before. Well, they're probably pretty relaxed right now. They've got a certain sequence to follow and go through, and uh, they've been training for this for an awful long time. And these times are probably the most relaxed. It's easier than some of the simulations you have to go through. And they're anxious to fly, and they want to get this off. So they're probably pretty calm, pretty relaxed, well-trained astronauts that have things under control. Are astronauts getting older? Yeah, I'm one is 44, I'm they one are. is 49. Joe Engel has waited 15 years to fly on this mission since coming to NASA. Dick Truly about 12. And they are getting older, but there's a lot of experience behind these people. They both wear spectacles too, don't they? I thought all you flyers, all you, and you're a former Navy you flyer. What do you mean both of them wear spectacles? <laughs> Age does catch up. We all wear spectacles I eventually. You all have to have cat's eyes for this sort of work. Well, we all did when we were younger. A lot of us had much better than 2020 vision, but. The biological process does catch up, and uh, we get that nearsightedness that uh, we suffer from. Let's just see what's happening at the Cape. T minus five minutes, 30 seconds. And pilot Dick Truly has signified the auxiliary power units are ready to be started. Auxiliary power units ready to be started, Dick. We've heard this before, haven't we, about APUs. Uh, they've changed the oil, flushed the systems out. We expect no problem from APUs this time around. But this is the stage uh, eight days ago that they spotted a problem. Well, the APUs didn't have the problem at this moment. They did have one or a problem later on during the countdown. They're starting APUs now. Those APUs are being started. Last time was paraffin in the filters. Forty-four seconds and counting. That's uh, the tower. Minus four thirty. T minus four minutes thirty seconds and counting. 
We have a total of 16 minutes of hydrazine supply for running the APUs prior to a liftoff. APU start is complete. Let's go aboard. APU start is complete. APUs are working. Minus four minutes, sure ten are. seconds, and counting. One oil change after a million miles. <laughs> I wish my car would do that. <laughs> T minus four minutes. We have begun nitrogen purge of the main engines on the orbiter. Now what's that mean? T minus three minutes, 50 seconds. Well, they're just counting. purging the systems to get all of any contaminants are in there to flush them out, have seconds. a fresh start with everything you've got. Speed brake and rudder are being moved through a pre-programmed pattern to assure that they'll be ready to be used in flight. Little exhaust from the APUs coming out the tail of the orbiter, indicating that all is well. T minus three minutes, 28 seconds and counting. The shuttle is now on internal power. However, the fuel cells are still receiving their fuel from the ground support system through the tail service mast for one more minute. T minus three minutes, 15 seconds. The profile checks of the aero surfaces have been completed and checked. T minus three minutes, five seconds. The engine gimbal or movement check is underway to assure that they're ready for flight control. They're wiggling all the bits that these motors yeah, have to move. Everything that can wiggle is being wiggled. Seconds yeah, that's counting. right. The LOX valve on the external tank has been closed and pressurization begun. After the tank is pressurized, the hold capability is limited. T minus 2 minutes 40 seconds. We have cleared the caution and warning memory. The gaseous oxygen vent arm is uh, being retracted. The who presses the button? The launch director or the computer? Well, it's that computer that's this automatic sequence. And it's on, it's on time, and the clock will do all of this for us right now. It's on board supply. T minus 2 minutes, 15 seconds. The main engines have been gimbaled to their start position, and the pressure on the liquid oxygen tank is at flight pressure. Coming up on the 2 minute point. T minus two minutes and counting. The liquid nit hydrogen vent valve has been closed and flight pressurization underway. T minus one minute, 50 seconds and counting. The gaseous oxygen vent arm is almost fully retracted. T minus one minute, 40 seconds and counting. minus one minute 30 seconds 90 seconds away from launch of STS-2 T minus one minute 15 seconds and counting the liquid hydrogen tank is at flight pressure coming up on the one minute point in our countdown everything going smoothly T minus one minute and counting. T minus 50 seconds. The firing system for the ground suppression water is armed. T minus 40 seconds. Development flight instrument recorders are on. T minus 37 seconds. We're about just a few seconds away from switching control of launch to the computer sequencer. We have control of the countdown now being conducted by the launch sequencers on board the orbiter. T minus 20 seconds and counting. The SRB hydraulic power units have started. The SRB nozzles have been moved to start position. Coming up on 10, T minus 10, 9. We have go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Minus three, two, one. We have ignition. We have ignition of the solid rocket boosters and liftoff. Liftoff of America's space shuttle, and the space shuttle has cleared the tower. Houston now controlling the mission control. Confirmed roll maneuver started. Rolling to the proper azimuth of the launch. 20 seconds. Thrust looks good. 25 seconds, roll maneuver completed. 30 seconds, 
Columbia now one nautical mile in altitude. 35 seconds, status check emission controlled by Flight Director Neil Hutchinson, given a go at 40 seconds. Columbia Houston, your go at 40. Roger, go at 40. Master alarm, man, it's the, uh... 48 seconds, throttling inch down for Mexican. Roger, ignore the master alarm, Columbia. Oh, okay, no. Coming up on prey to maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Mark one minute, Columbia now five nautical miles in altitude, three nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 2,300 feet per second. One minute, eight seconds, pass through Max Q. Columbia still looking good, throttling engines back to 100%. Mark, one minute, 20 seconds. Columbia now nine nautical miles in altitude, six nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 3,000 feet per second. Magnificent picture, Dick. Yeah, it's a great picture. Mark, one minute, 35 seconds. Columbia now 14 nautical miles in altitude, 10 nautical miles downrange. Columbia, Houston, uh, you can expect an EVAP, CNW. One, one minute, 45 seconds, coming up on negative seats where altitude's too high for ejection seat. Your negative seats. Okay, they can't use the seats for recovery now. Mark, one minute, 55 seconds, Columbia now 21 nautical miles in altitude, 18 nautical miles down range, velocity now reading 5,000 feet per second. Standing by now for solid rocket booster separation confirmation. Roger, copy, PC less than 50. Boosters, there they go. Solid rocket boosters just came off. $28 million dollars each. <laughs> We're going to get them back. Good solid rocket booster separation. Smooth as glass, Houston. Two minutes, 25 seconds. Onboard guidance is converging as program. Columbia is now steering for its precise window in space for main engine cutoff. Columbia now 35 nautical miles in altitude, 40 nautical miles downrange. Okay, Houston, the uh, temps are coming down and uh, looking good. Roger, Columbia, thank you. Mark, two minutes, 45 seconds. Columbia now has two engine landing capability at Rotor Naval Air Station, Spain. Two minutes, 54 seconds. Uh, Status if one engine went control. out, they Give still have two engines they minutes. could abort to Rota, Spain, if Rota, necessary. Looking good at three. Roger, copy, looking good at three. Those chase planes are way behind now, Dick. Yeah, they sure are. They're not going to catch up either. Mark, three minutes, eight seconds. Uh, Columbia now 46 nautical miles in altitude, 66 nautical miles downrange. Columbia's three main engines continue to run smoothly. Engel and truly really moving out now. Velocity now reading 6,700 feet per second. What's it feel like sitting there? It's a great ride. It's a great feeling. Mark, three minutes, 30 seconds. Columbia now 52 nautical miles in altitude, 85 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 7,000 feet per second. Return status check and emission control by flight director Neil Hutchinson. Engel and truly given a go to continue. You feel all that thrust, it's a smooth ride, and you know you're on your way. And it's at this stage, of course, well, Mark, since... Mark, 3 minutes, 55 seconds, Columbia now 58 nautical miles in altitude, 112 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 7,900 feet per second. Of course, the post-launch period uh, in, the, seconds, uh, standing in the lap of Houston mission control now rather than launch control at the yeah. plane. They switch over right after liftoff. Mark, negative return. I think I heard negative return, which means they cannot come back to the landing site. They would have to go on into orbit or in the road to Spain. Well, that call up Engel and Truly now committed to space travel. They can no longer turn around and return to the launch site. Four minutes, 35 seconds. Columbia now 60. Columbia Houston, you're pressed to ATO. Press to ATO means they can go into Four abort to orbit. Four seconds. Uh, for the first time, Columbia has uh, forward abort to orbit capability on two engines by throttling engines up to 107 percent. They say it's the safest place to be if you're in uh, trouble. You bet. In orbit. <laughs> they can go to 107 percent, which is a change from the first flight. Five minutes. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 189 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 10,300 feet per second. Columbia Houston, your normal throttles. That, that means they don't have to go to 107 percent. They can do it at 100 percent. Brandon Stein says that England truly now capable of abort to orbit on two engines without throttling up Columbia's engines. Five minutes, 25 seconds. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 228 nautical miles downrange. 
Half a ton of fuel a second being burnt there, Dick. That's, that's an awful lot of it. And you can still see that. Isn't that a great sight? Of course, you can't see much, but Mark, the five minutes, exhaust plume. Mark, 5 minutes, 40 seconds, uh, standing by for press to Miko. Press to Miko means that they can get into orbit. Our main engine cutoff. Columbia, Houston, you're press to Miko. Roger, press to Miko. That means everything looks five good. Minutes. This is really smooth. Five minutes, 55 seconds. The press to Miko call from uh, Capcom Brandon Stein says, should Columbia lose but one engine, press on, keep flying forward. Columbia's engines have enough uh, energy to, a two, uh, to achieve normal attitude. Single engine rotor and everything's looking good. And okay, Dan, single engine rotor and looking good here. That means they could get to rota just on one engine now. Mark, so six minutes, 18 shape. seconds. That report from Capcom Brandon Stein indicates if a two-engine failure occurred, Columbia is capable of an emergency landing at Rota Naval Air Station, Spain. Mark, six minutes, 30 seconds. Columbia now 68 nautical miles in altitude, 346 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading uh, 14,900 feet per second. A couple of minutes now from main engine cutoff. Mark, six minutes, 50 seconds. Uh, Columbia now 67 nautical miles in altitude, 397 nautical miles downrange. Columbia pitching over now, diving to increase velocity, decrease altitude, giving Columbia her most favorable attitude. Seven minutes, five seconds. Standing by now for single engine press to Miko. Which means that they could get to, they could actually get to orbit Columbia on one engine. At 107 percent. They actually control the engine. Yes. That's new, isn't it? Seven minutes, 20 seconds. That report says that England truly can achieve uh, uh, normal engine cutoff targets even if two engines go out. If if two went out, they had one remaining, Mark, they could still get into seconds. orbit. Columbia now 64 nautical miles in altitude, 511 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 20,000 feet per second. Not a luxury you had, but... <laughs> no, that's G true. Forces building for England truly now, coming up to three Gs. Columbia now 63 nautical miles in altitude, 562 nautical miles downrange. What's three Gs feel like? It's not bad with the position you're in on that couch. You're pressed back Mark, to your back. Eight minutes. Columbia, Houston, you're go at eight. Go at eight. Another half a minute Columbia's to... Columbia's main engine's uh, slowly being throttled back now. Should be throttled at 65% at six seconds before main engine cutoff. Columbia now 63 nautical miles in altitude, 645 nautical miles downrange. Velocity now reading 24,000 feet per second. Only 1,000 more feet to go. We don't have a picture Eight of minutes, the... 28 seconds. Uh, exhaust plume at this stage. <laughs> That's probably all you would see, but... Okay, you said we got a good Miko. There it is. Engine shut off on time. Roger, we copy, Columbia. Confirm shutdown. Uh, Columbia now returned to space, not yet returned to orbit. Uh, standing by now for external tank separation. Columbia, Houston, you can ignore the IMU bites. That was a, that was a glitch on our inertial measuring unit. They can ignore it. Eight minutes, 58 seconds. Confirm external tank separation. ATCEP, that erasure good. Columbia now, Columbia now performing an evasive maneuver, moving below and beyond the external tank. They just use their RCS system, their reaction control system. Nine minutes, fifteen seconds. That's a small engine. Just a small engine, no, no, just to move static, away from the tank. Control for the first ohms burn. You don't want to hit it again. No. Roger, Columbia. We're looking at them. And now those smaller engines give it the final pushes to orbit. Yes, they're orbital maneuvering system Columbia, engines. Houston, uh, your go for nominal ohms one, and for APU shutdown on time. Which will occur about 10:30. Okay, they're, they're maneuvering to the proper Nine attitude to seconds. make that burn. Columbia now maneuvering to ohms one burn attitude using the two 6,000 pound thrust engines. Ohms one will be posi grade, uh, moving Columbia forward and higher on her flight path, placing Columbia in orbit. But until the ohms, the o orbital maneuvering system comes in. They're coasting at the moment. Yes, they, no are, power on. they are coasting and they're really not in orbit yet. Columbia, Houston, uh, we're they have to make that burn. Software bites uh, right at Miko, uh, no problem. Okay, and we've got uh, three on loop. Uh, I'll leave that about ten, but we'll catch it in the I didn't catch that, did you, Peter? No. Faded out on us. They must be losing signal right now, which means just a temporary loss of communications. I thought you, that only happened on the way back.
<laughs> well, you got to skip between the ground stations, so you do lose. There is a capability they lose the picking it up on a satellite, but they can lose it in between. Well, there you are. Columbia made it at last for that second historic test flight. More from us in a moment, but we're going to do what Joe Anglin Dick truly can't do right now. We're going to take a small break. <laughs> Welcome back to ITN Space Studio. If you're wondering what's happened to your regular programme, I believe it's Hazel, it should be on right now, you will be seeing it, but next week. For now, let me just tell you, if you've just joined us, that you've missed the most sensational launch, the second launch, the te second test flight of the Space Shuttle Columbia. But we will be showing it you again later on in the programme, before we go. But now, let's, uh, we've got some more picture in from the Cape. Earlier this morning, before the launch, of course, of the, today's crew, Joe Engel and Dick Truly, who waited between them some 30 years for today's flight, which went absolutely perfectly, suiting up, getting, on, getting into their gear for the flight. Dick Gordon, Apollo 12 astronaut, is this the same sort of gear as you wore? No, Peter, it's not. Uh, this suit is particularly designed just for the use of the ejection seat. Uh, the ejection seat can be used up to 120,000 feet. It's not an extravehicular activity suit. It's just for use in case they have to leave the shuttle, leave the no, booster, and come back ready. down in parachutes. And that's really what it was designed for. And here they are, leaving the, the astronauts' headquarters building for the pad. Do they carry on board the, the shuttle an, an EVA suit, a suit they can get out and walk in? As oh, you yes, they certainly do. And one of the tests during this flight will have uh, Joe Engel donning this suit and going through all the procedures for an EVA up and to the you point. You see the convoy there driving past that. Now, what's that, Dick? That's well, that's uh, just all the security and everybody that's... Uh, what's that rocket? Oh, that's a Saturn V, I believe, sitting there, wasn't it? On its side. I've never yeah. seen one on its yeah. side before. <laughs> <laughs> Not the view you're used to getting no, with a Saturn no. V. <laughs> now, what of the men themselves who will be piloting Columbia into space, who are now heading for orbit? Um, in the, the upper atmosphere. Joe Engel and Dick Truly, they both waited, as I said, a long time for this day, their first blast off. Joe Engel, in fact, got his astronaut's wing as long ago as 1964. A B 52 bomber used to carry a rocket powered research plane called the X 15. And Engel was one of an elite team of test pilots who'd be carried in the X 15, slung under the bomber's wings as high as it could go. Then, as you can see here, the X 15 separated and went solo, reaching heights of nearly 70 miles. 50 miles high qualifies you to call yourself an astronaut, which is all valuable experience for Joe Engel today. The techniques and the flight control systems, uh, the manner in which we fly a maneuvering re-entry from space back into the atmosphere, manage the energy, terminating in a conventional landing on a lake bed now, but eventually on a runway, uh, that technique that we're using on the space shuttle uh, was pioneered and, in fact, very similar to the same technique that we used on the X-15 20 years ago. Uh, we've got that knowledge and know-how and the confidence to do it. Dick Gordon, were you ever involved with the X-15? Well, Peter, as a matter of fact, when I finished my test pilot experiencing, uh, experiences in uh, 1958, there were three Navy pilots that were in the process of being added to the X-15 team. Uh, that process meant that one of the three was going to uh, join the X-15 team at Edwards Air Force Base. I was one of those, was not selected. A gentleman by the name of uh, Forrest Peterson was selected for the X-15 program. That's a long time ago. Do you agree with Joe Engel that the shuttle now owes a lot? Its pedigree has a lot of X-15 in it. Oh, there's no question about it. Joe mentioned the energy management, terminal area guidance, and the exact techniques that are used in shuttle were demonstrated very aptly in the X-15 and in its return from space flight. Even though it was not an orbital flight, uh, they experienced some of the same kinds of problems that uh, present themselves in the shuttle landing itself. Now, of course, you were using, with the X-15, wings on the fringes of space. Now we've come back to wings for space flight and return. Why did they move away from wings in the first place? It seems a natural thing to do, actually, to fly back, doesn't it? Well, it certainly is a natural thing to do, but I think at the time, if you recall, uh, the expediency of the United States getting into space 
as quick as we possibly could, said that they had to do something else. And really those engineering and political decisions were made in the fact that Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, which of course was mandated to go to the moon, that had to take a particular kind of vehicle. Therefore, it really interrupted the development or the follow-on programs that the X-15 really became the father of. When you talk of, of the expediency, including the political expediency, do you mean that because the Soviet Union started to throw men up into space, uh, spam in the can on top of these big rockets of theirs, <laughs> that the United States felt they had to compete at that oh, level? I, oh, I think very definitely. That's one of the very definite things that one of the parameters went into that decision-making process. And it was the fastest way for us to get men into space and compete as we were in those early days of the space program for orbital flight and subsequently to fly to the moon and back. Do you think there is still a role for that sort of space travel, the expendable rocket, which simply throws up a piece of equipment? I, I do. Uh, it's something that really would have to take a great deal of discussion. We're seeing a method today in utilization of a shuttle to get experiments cargo into space. There is an argument or a hypothesis that could be presented that says to keep our expendable technology going that we should continue to use expendables and very likely put some of that cargo into space where it could later be joined by the shuttle, assembled or whatever the case may be in that particular regard. This method then would say that you could use a shuttle as a passenger vehicle as opposed to a cargo carrier. And there's a lot of sense in that kind of argument. We have chosen to go with the shuttle as both the passenger carrier and a cargo, but we have tended to neglect the expendable rocket side of that picture. Do you think the shuttle is an expensive way of carrying cargo? In some regards, yes, but the reusability of it obviously brings that particular cost figure down. The more we use it, the overall cost of that particular program will come down. But you can see the trouble and the problems we're having, in, even though it's a test program of getting the vehicle into space, a lot of cargo carrying expendables could put a lot of experiments and things in space that we could utilize. More from, more from Dick Gordon in a moment, but let me remind you that the Space Shuttle Columbia got off safely and perfectly on its second test flight at 10 past three. That's 17, just under 17 minutes ago. Now, of course, it's headed for orbit. It'll take it about 40 minutes, just over 40 minutes to get into orbit. Let me, uh, s let me go now to the Cape itself. Are we going to the Cape, to John Suchet, who I think uh, saw the launch, I know saw the launch. John, how did it go down at the Cape? Oh, Peter, what a, what a really thrilling sight it is to see it live. Um, you don't actually hear the roar of the engines for about five seconds, just as it begins to lift off and then you're completely enveloped by this amazing roar. But you know, in a funny kind of way, it's, it's rather like listening to a large car being over-revved. I know you've had a marvelous picture of it at home, and it fills your screen, but when you see it set here in this vast swampland, it, you, you're reminded how small it is. And this roar is in proportion to its size, um, and, you know, it really is smaller than a DC-9 going up into space, and you suddenly think, yes, th th this isn't just... Uh, a rarefied form of a space adventure. This is the beginning of passenger travel in space. Um, and when you realize that, you, you suddenly realize that one day this could become an ordinary means of travel. And the overriding impression you're left with here is that this is a, a useful thing. This is maybe what we or our children will one day be riding on. Quite an amazing sight. Back to you. John, thank you very much. Well, earlier in the programme, we interrupted uh, Dr Gary Hunt, who was giving us an account of the other big first today. That's the payload which uh, the Space Shuttle Columbia is carrying into space for the first time. A number of scientific experiments. Gary, we got as far as the two experiments in the cabin. And I think you were telling us that one of them actually consists of, uh, what, a number of plants which have gone into space. Yes, we've in fact we're growing time. plants in zero gravity, which sounds a little strange thing to be doing. But also we're looking to see how these, grant, these plants develop with different sort of moisture contents. And this could have valuable implications for la later utilization of this region. Also, they also have their handheld cameras. I'm sure Dick has used these himself. And of course, one of the things we want to know more about the development of large storms, lightning effects, and so on, which we've seen affected Dick in his early uh, space travel. So they're photographing lightning and using this to provide information which hopefully will help in weather forecasting too. So even the astronauts got 
scientific jobs to do. How long is the waiting list among scientists to get their experiment into orbit? Well, it's, we have proposals that have been going around for several years. I was involved with one selected several years ago. And then so the waiting list could be three to five years. It can then be flown. It doesn't mean to say you're on the next shuttle flight. You may have to wait several years after that. But it could be put on a free flyer. In other words, a, a mission that was not coming back to Earth. So we could use shuttle as a testing ground. That's the new development. But what's the, what's the central reason it's so important to scientists? I'm talking of, of the peaceful uh, applications. We'll come to the military ones in a minute. But what's the, what's the central importance to this, to scientists, to get, an, to get an experiment into orbit? Well, of course, if you take my own field in meteorology, we're trying to improve our understanding of the weather, and we want to develop new experiments to learn certain new facets about the, the environment. And this is a way we can try out an experiment, and then build another one and try it out again, before we put it in orbit where it can stay for several years, giving us continuous data. This is a training ground, an opportunity which previously we had just used balloons for the very occasional flight. So this is a whole new concept, and I think it's going to make a dramatic step forward for space, uh, space exploration and space studies. Now, of course, in the list of payloads that are queuing to go into space abo aboard Columbia, there are a very high proportion of classified experiments, uh, experiments sponsored by the United States Department of Defense. And the Soviet Union have complained the shuttle is being developed primarily for military purposes. And it would be surprising, indeed, if such huge sums of money, getting on for $10 billion, were put into rocketry in this day and age without there being a strong military flavor. Our defense correspondent, Geoffrey Archer, looks at some of the possible military applications. Between them, the Americans and the Russians have some 70 satellites in space working specifically for the military. Communications links provide instant transmission of vast amounts of information between soldiers in the field and their commanders. Spy satellites using TV, film and infrared sensors can spot the locations of weapons with remarkable accuracy. Navigation satellites will give an exact position on the globe to within a few feet to ships, planes and even individual soldiers. But with the military relying on space, the vulnerability of satellites to attack is becoming a major worry. The Russians have tested killer satellites which chase other spacecraft and blow them up, and they seem to have had some success. The Americans now plan to use the high-flying F-15 fighter to launch a missile which will home in on satellites. But the shuttle makes the use of space cheaper and some Pentagon chiefs think the way to protect satellites in the future will be to use gigantic lasers in space as ray guns. Recent American research indicates the technology for lasers with a million watts of power is feasible. But the equipment to find distant targets and to aim a laser to burn a vital spot up to 10,000 miles away has yet to be built. But the space shuttle will be taking up just such equipment for testing in a few years' time. And indeed, the large and relatively cheap cargo carrying capacity of the shuttle will be vital to get into orbit the very large components that a laser battle station would need. While All right, let's get a comment from Apollo astronaut Dick Gordon. Dick, do you believe shuttle would ever have been built if it didn't have a prominent military role? Oh, well, Peter, it would have been a very difficult thing to justify if it hadn't. Back in the early days of the, of the design of the shuttle, DOD had a very strong input. A great deal of the design features in shuttle and a great many of its performance requirements were dictated by the Department of Defense. Like the size of the payload doors. And cross range for launching from Vandenberg Air Force Base. The very size of the cargo bay itself. A lot of these things were definitely a requirement that came out of DOD.